Oh, huh? let's start my recording. Uh, so uh, today we're going to be going through that little take home exercise that we talked about for today. But at least as importantly, we're going to be speaking about some of these key concepts that arise when reasoning about contagion, reasoning about communication of infectious diseases or other types of contagion. Can anyone here give me some examples beyond spread of communicable pathogens, things like viruses and bacteria and parasites and, and uh, types of microbes? Can anyone mention other types of things that are characterized by contagion? This sort of spread uh, where, where one individual having it is a risk factor to another individual getting it, as it's sometimes described. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rashid, is it? Yes. Waterborne disease is true. So that's true. And, and there are certain microbes uh, in them uh, that, that um, uh, you know, pose real risks. Uh, Vibria cholerae um, causes cholera, which is a major source of, of death, particularly in, in the context of worldwide uh, emergencies, things like recoveries from natural disasters, earthquakes, et cetera. Um, uh, cholera, when sanitation is poor, can be, uh, can be disastrous. But beyond, beyond pathogens beyond these things that infect us what other things spread say from one person to another um in in a similar fashion yes Utwal. Um, can spread what rumors rumors excellent excellent so rumors spread in a similar fashion what's another thing besides rumors yes uh name Albert. Uh, money. Okay, that's that's an interesting idea. Uh, gosh, um, I suppose there could be some uh, some ways in which that that could be true. Um, there's some micro lending schemes where maybe me lending you money lets you make money, which lets you pass it on to others and 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 help them make money. So so maybe. I, that's a really interesting one. I, I, I appreciate you bringing up a, a quite fascinating example. Yes, uh, no. Ardalan. No. Knowledge. Good. I mean, service, we can say that kind of, I mean, giving services. Uh, maybe. Um, we can teach this, uh, for example, we say, uh, I mean, teaching is kind of a service. If you want to say. Yeah, okay. Okay, so spread of, of, of like uh, tutorials, et cetera. So I like that idea. How about other things? Um, uh, there, so so these are all excellent, but but it's a very broad class actually that could spread this way. I don't, what are some other ones? Uh, Arlan, yeah. Uh, software features. Uh, For example, okay. If you use an update, you will spread okay. out. The okay, software. so so one piece of software might incorporate uh, an innovative feature, yes. and another copies it, and more broadly, this points to the spread of innovation. And indeed, innovation can spread over networks, and innovation does spread over networks. It often originates not in the core of the network, but the periphery, and it makes its way um, across the network. Uh, but yes, it's a it's a key topic of contagion. Matthias, yes. Ideas, yeah. Spread of ideas, yeah. Spread of, of uh, thoughts about things. These could be helpful thoughts. They sometimes could be not helpful thoughts. You know, uh, rumors, uh, can be ugly, uh, conspiratorial ideas that are totally off base can spread, memes, right? Um, uh, what's that? Conspiracy theories, like all of these things have this flavor of of, of spreading and, and you're having it poses a risk of, of if, if I'm in contact with you, me getting it, right? Um, I say risk, but... Um, it, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. So there's a lot of phenomena marked by this sort of contagion. And um, 
we build models of this contagion because it is so universally germane in many spheres. Earliest on, it originated for infectious diseases. The work of uh, Ross in 1916 and malaria, or McKendrick 1927-28, uh, laying the frown, groundwork for the exact model we built last time in this class and that you extended. But the truth is this covers a much broader set of things. And there's been plenty of people looking with similar model structure, looking at things like the spread of innovation, of ideas, the spread of, of conspiracies, the spread of uh, you know, uh, new ways of doing things or, or memes online, uh, et cetera. Um, so these, these relate to, to phenomena that are extremely common. Um, and uh, I'd like to go reflect on that model that we built last time so that we can uh, go learn from it a little bit more. And I wanna particularly uh, relate it to some of the concepts you will have learned in those videos uh, and particularly in the video for today. Um, but I really wanna link it in with the type of reasoning we get with stocks and flows. This is one of the key components of this, this module of the course is really reasoning up about things consistently in stocks and flows. And if you can carry that sort of reasoning forward, it's nothing specific to, it's nothing beholden to, it's nothing that privileges stock and flow diagrams. You can actually carry it to all the sorts of models we're talking about, discrete events, agent-based, and system dynamics. And you could carry it into reasoning about the world. Okay, so this, ladies and gentlemen, um, what we see before us now was uh, a model we built in class last time. And remember that it's up on the Canvas site for anyone who's, who's uh, Wants to, wants to grab it. Um, and in it, we had susceptibles, infectives, and recovery. Um, susceptibles were individuals, susceptible to the contagion. We spoke about it here as if it were an infectious disease, but it, 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 it needs to be a pathogen, but it needs to be, it might be an idea. Right? They're susceptible to this idea, susceptible to this rumor, susceptible to this conspiracy theory. And then there are people who have been infected by it or who have been sort of taken it up at some level. This conspiracy theory, this idea, this meaning, uh, this innovation, and are spreading it to others. And, and some of that spread may be deliberate, it may be proselytization or sort of going out and trying to convince people, but it may also just be other people see this very innovative feature in the software project, the product, and they say, wow, that's, that's a cool idea. I bet we can do that. And maybe more of a, you know, observing and, and adoption more driven by the, by the susceptible. But then the infected here infect or influence and transmit the contagion to the susceptible. But after some period of time, they can recover and they may move on from that idea. They may move on from, from talking about it, talking about this conspiracy theory or this rumor. You know, maybe there were once a QAnon, wacko conspiracy adherent, and now they've moved on in their life. And, and so they're in this recovered state. Now, this model packs a lot into it. And, and there's many features of this module that are illustrated in this, in this model. Um, we talked in our previous lecture about the ability to, to transliterate or, or, or uh, uh, to directly translate at a sort of one-to-one -one basis between a model like this and a series of, of equations. Uh, and I'd like to do that here. So we're going to call susceptible S, we're going to call infective I and R, we're going to call recovered. 
So we're going to have three stocks, S, I, and R. These are the state variables. Collectively, they hold the state. And we're going to be writing down equations that describe what about those variables. They describe how those variables what? Rate of change. And we write that as, I'm going to put a dot among it, but if you don't like that, you could write it ds dt and di dt um, and dr dt. Maybe that will be more comfortable for some of you. Um, the rate of change of s over time. If s, if the s dt is five, what does that mean? Okay, five units of change. Let's say this is measured in people. Well, and let's suppose time is measured in days. What would that mean? Okay, okay. so if DSDT were equal to five here, what would it mean? Yeah, five more people are getting susceptible per day, right? If it were minus five, what would it mean? It's going down by five people per day. You comfortable with that? That's the real rate of change, right? It's all idea of a derivative. Tells us rate change in T time. How does S change, right? Um, okay. So we're going to translate, and and so these are going to be the state variables, and we're going to have parameters. We're going to have three parameters in the model. That's contacts per person today. We're going to give it a short name of C. Okay. And uh, and then uh, we sh we could set this this lecture to music. Um, and there's a probability of tra transmission per discordant contact. And we're going to call that beta by convention. You could call it p, but it's a probability between zero and one. C is of unit one over time. Beta is of unit one. It's it's like number of heads over total number of coin flips. So it's if you count heads and tens of thousands, and you count coin flips and tens of thousands, the, the units cancel. So this is this is a fraction. It's it's a unit dimension. It's dimensionless. You could change time dimension from days to weeks. It wouldn't matter to this. You could change how you measure people from. From a million people, one could mean a million people, or one could mean one person. It's not going to change that. Okay. Um, and uh, and then beyond this, we're going to have a recovery time, which we call mean time for infective. I'm going to call it, I'm going to call it tau. Okay. This is a time. So in this case, the time unit of the model was days. So uh, we're going to have uh, time be measured in, in days. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, S is person. So the, the units of S, we sometimes write in brackets here, are person. And the same thing with, with I and, and with R here. Um, the, the units of each of them are the dimensions or persons. Okay, great. So given this, what what is the, if I were to write down the equation, let's start with a simple one. Let's start with the R18. What things influence the number of recovered? Uh, yes, so Harriet, yeah. New recoveries. And so what we need to say, the rate of change of these, is there anything leaving recovered right now? Right now? No, the only thing's coming in. So we're gonna have a flow in here on the right, right? Okay. And what's that flow going to be? Can anyone tell me? Okay, it's gonna be positive, darn right, because it's a flow in. Um, so, What's the formula for it going to be? Well, we could go look at the formula for this. 
and we'd see it's effective divided by mean time effective. So how would I write it in terms of these symbols? Infective is what? Okay, but okay, okay, but infective is what symbol here? If the symbol is I, okay, and what's mean time infective? Tau. So it's I divided by tau, right? It, it has to be. This is a if if f is measured in persons, the SDT is is the units of it or the dimensions of it is or what persons per unit time. Um, so drdt, it's it's how much does it change per unit time? So it's like your person divided by time. Hmm. Right. Um, so if it went up by 10 people over 10 days, it would be one person per day. Right. Um, if it went up by one person per day, then it's one over day, uh, one over time. So, so the units of this have to be one over time, time, and and or sorry, have to be person per unit time. I is is in person. Too. Tau is, is in is in time. Good. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's. Okay. Is there anything else for R? We need it. anything else to transcribe this into these into this. The answer is no. That's it. Okay. How about how about for DIDT? We're going to have inflows. We're going to have outflows. What outflows do we have? I'm giving you a freebie. People getting recovered. And what's the formula for that? Yeah, it's I over tau. It's the same thing. These two are the same because it flows out here and goes here. But what's different here instead of this one? This one had a plus in front of it implicitly because it's a flow in to recover, right? What is it here? Minus because it's a flow out, right? Okay. Um, okay. What do we have for the flow in to I now? Okay. Okay. So, how many people? So, for the flow into infectives is what? It, it describe describe what it what it, you know at, a, at an intuitive level. What is the flow into infectives? It's called what? It's called no infection. They're from susceptible, but the flow is called new infection, right? And we could go look at new infections here, but you'd see it's susceptible times force of infection. And we, we'd have to go unpack what force of infection is. And we see it depends on total population and fractional prevalence. But when we write this down, when we transliterate it in this way, we collapse it all down. All those wonderful human abstractions we use in building up these models and software engineering, they all, when you represent as ODEs, they all get collapsed down. So we're going to write it down in its collapsed down form, and it's sort of most elemental form. We lose something there. I want to be clear. We lose something. And um, there's a value to retaining these human abstractions, but for the purposes of this discussion, we're, we're, we're going to collapse it all down, as is the convention, uh, for better or for worse, uh, when, when writing down ODEs. So I'm going to write this one in, in this kind of orangey color. OK? Um, so ladies and gentlemen, um, help me write down the formula here. I'm going to write it down. There will be a divided by, but but. What does this depend on? Well, first it depends on what? Susceptibles, right? Because it says susceptibles, right? Okay, good. I'm gonna put it last. What else does it depend on? Well, we could, we could kind of look here. <laughs> I don't wanna end up in a bad way. So, so new infections ultimately depends on the probability of transmission, the contacts per day. I'm just following it back by transit closure of this graph. Call it 
Right? It depends on course of infection, that depends on probability of contact per day of practical prevalence, which in turn depends on infective and total population. And total population, what is the formula for total population? Anyone? Uh huh. S plus I plus R, right? Okay, so we've got a lot there. So it depends on all of those. And I'm going to, does anyone remember this right away or, uh, or should I walk you through it again? Anyone remember? This is a, this is a key formula. If anyone wanted to put it forward, you could. Okay, there's a fractional prevalence in there. That's absolutely right. Well, let's go through uh, Harriet. Yeah. For for the number of people getting infected before the susceptible, there's there's kind of a story associated with it that I went through in the final minutes last time. Uh huh. Contacts per day. It starts with the contacts. Each susceptible has a number of contacts per day with with anyone with you know, and that's C, that's C up here, okay? Good. And of those contacts, what do we have to consider? People that are, of those contacts, if we're susceptible, what are we afraid about those contacts? If I'm going and mixing with you, what am I afraid of? Yeah, I'm afraid of the infectives amongst those, right? So of these contacts, we say, a certain fraction are infective. And where do we pull that fraction out of? Well, it's going to be some, some, some quantity here. It's going to be the, yeah, the number of infective and the, the fraction of infectives in the whole what? Population. I mean, we don't have anything else to go on, right? So it's S over S plus I plus R, right? There we go. There we go. That's, I mean, if, if I had to ask you, that's a fraction, right? It's what fraction of S plus I plus R, which is the what total population are infected, right? Huh? They've got to be in one of S or I and R, right? So that's a fraction that are infected. Okay, so if we have C times this, that's giving an estimate of. How many contacts each susceptible has with what per day with infective people? If C, if they have contact with 100 people per day total, and if 50% of the whole population is infected, 50%, then on average, they have contact with 100 people, if 50% of the whole population is infected. Then we might expect them to have contacts on average with how many people per day? 50, 50 infected people. Half, if half the population is infected, we'll assume half of those 100 people they mix with per day are infected. Does that make sense? So C times this. This is the thinking I want you to be able to use. Hmm? Um, and then, so that's the, that, the multiplication of those two is the, Number of people per day, number of infective people per day they're having contact with. And we say each of them will have a probability what of getting, of transmitting them the infective, transmitting the susceptible the infection. Probability what? Each of those infectives will have probability who are, are having contact with them will have probability what? Theta. That's the probability that. For a given contact between a susceptible and an infective, that it will be transmitted. So if they have contact with 50 people per day that are infective, and each of them confers a 1% chance of infection, we say they have about a 50% chance, right? 50 on 0.01. Does that make sense? Now, you can look into it more and Find that actually that's that that ignores the fact people can't get infected more than once and, and so on, but turns out it's it's pretty good if these uh, numbers are, are small and, and people have looked at do we get exactly and it really doesn't make much difference, it turns out. So this 
this is the formula. But you know, I want you to make sure you understand these different components. C is the number of contacts per day they have with anyone. C times S over S plus I plus R is the number of contacts the susceptible has with infected people. And then you multiply it times beta. It's the number of contacts, it's the probability. So if you have all three of these, it's the probability per day, probability per unit time, or I'll just write probability per time of infection. And what is that called? That probability per day they'll get infected. That has a very special name to it. In fact, it's so special, it's in this very diagram. It is called course of infection. Even as a special letter, lambda. Lambda is the force of infection. It's a different lambda than lambda, the ultimate imperative, lambda, the ultimate declarative. But I think that point will be lost on me. Um, that was 340 related. Um, anyway, uh, so here we go. This is our this is our formula for the number of people getting affected per day. And implicitly, there's a plus in front of it, right? I don't write the plus, but it's flowing in. So now what's the formula for S here? Fill it in, ladies and gentlemen. Complete the thought. What is it? Minus. Yeah, just minus the. Yeah, the same thing. It's minus the same same formula here. That's why I put them in both in orange. Whenever you have a flow going from one stock to the other, half of it sticks up here and half sticks down there. Hmm. This is captured nicely in a categorical description of these things, a category theory, but it's lost here. This is one of the things that gets lost when you just map it down to ODE. Now you've got these sort of two halves of the same thing. There's a unity to them that's lost, but this is one flow. This minus and plus here, these are two sides of the same flow. And these are two sides of the same flow here. One flowing out of S, one flowing into I. Are you comfortable with that? You comfortable with that? Okay. Uh, maybe someone can take a picture of that and post it because I think it's rather prudent. So, uh, okay. Thanks, Wade. Um, so let, let's get myself out of the image because I'm rather not pretty. Um, <laughs> Okay, thanks, Wade. Um, what's that? Sure, sure. <laughs> okay, okay, sure. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, these are our, our formulas. Now, I want to highlight the fact this is non linear. It takes two to tango here. Um, this is a linear term, this with i over tau. It's linear. If we double i, this double. If there's no infectives, no one's going to recover. If there's many infectives, many people will recover. It's different with uh, this, this formula here in, in orange. Why is it different? Well, it depends on S and I together. I'm going to tell you that it's not always the case that if you have tons and tons of susceptibles, that you'll have tons and tons of infectives. If, if, if S gets really, really, really large, that isn't necessarily a guarantee people will get infected because what else is needed? You need, beyond susceptibles, you need who? The person who's infected. You need a person who's infected. You can have all the susceptibles in the world, but if there's nobody infected, it's not going to spread to them, right? And likewise, if you have lots of people effective, but no one's susceptible, how much is it going to spread? Nothing. None at all. You need both. It's, this is a nonlinear term, F times I. And it turns out that has massive implications. Not obvious, but it has transformative implications. It means we have to, in general, when we have nonlinear models, numerically simulate them. It means that 
if we have an intervention, for example, um, and we scale it up by doubling its size, it does it double in its impact. It turns out it has huge impact in terms of something we'll be telling, talking about the structure of the state space and basins of attraction. And it means that the dynamics of the system can be different in different areas of the state space. We're gonna we're gonna come back to that, but but this is our transliteration. I want you to be able to do this, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to refer back to this in our work with this model. Okay, so this is kind of the underlying math of the model. If this, if I want to ask you. If this model, if this system were in balance, what would be the case? So we have the formulas for DSDT, DIDT, and DRDT. If this system were in balance, if it were not changing anymore, it will were in equilibrium, what would be the case? What form, what what property would hold here? Well, oh, sorry, say that again. Yeah, rate of change for, and I'm asking a, a bit of a trick question, for which one? For all of them. Harriet got it again, exactly. Equals zero, equals zero, equals zero. That would be, if it were in equilibrium, if it were in balance, if it were in a situation where it's not changing anymore, the rate of change of all of them has to be zero. We can't have I changing, but but as not changing and the whole system to be an equilibrium. The whole system equilibrium means that all of the rates of change are zero. Okay. Now we're going to come back to that later, but I want you to know that. Man, done really well. Did part of central questions, pop quizzes, the final, you know, you know, these sort of things. Okay. Let's let's now though talk about the dynamics of this. So we have this. We have this model here. We have this here model too. Okay, so if I were to run this model, what would I see in terms of the number of people infected? Anyone? I think what I'm going to do, just, just to make it a little bit clearer, is at the cost of taking another minute uh, or two, I'm going to draw out a time plot here we go here's a, a nice time plot mm -mm. there we go and this will be stocks time plot ah. and the value of this will be infected ah. and this will be infected ah. um and uh sure it'll be updating over uh one days and and that's fine and what did I have this model run for? I had it run, I had it stop never, but I'm going to make it stop at time. I'm going to say stop at time. Um, uh, fine, I'll, I'll say uh, time 100 for now. Good. Okay. So if I run this, what will I see on this graph? What site will I behold? Anyone? It will rise and fall. That's right. And maybe I'll just just so we have it all at once. I'm going to add in here susceptibles. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, I mixed up the title and the the name. This should be susceptible. It's referring to the value. There we go. And and I'm going to call this recovered. And I'm going to call it recovered here. Recovered. There we go. And just to make it real nice, um, I'm going to put these in order uh, like that, uh, so that they they will display uh, or they'll be shown here nicely. And I built and I'm happy, and I'm happy. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to run this. And what Matthias has said is that that the number of infectives will go up and then go down. How about the number of susceptibles? What is that going to do? I'm gonna do it before I run this. What is the number of susceptibles going to do? Uh, it'll go, go down. Why won't it ever go up? 
Right now, will the success will ever go up now? No, no it's not. Like and and how do we know it won't go up? Because we don't have uh, we don't have any it doesn't we don't have any recover to the success. Yeah, exactly. There's no one coming in to successful. It can only stay the same or go down, right? We can only leave or stay. Okay. Uh, it, it can't. But what is the recovery going to do? It goes right now. Sorry. It'll increase. It'll it'll go up. It can only stay the same or go up. So let's let's see that. And the your comments prove prescient, if not prophetic. Um, and uh, this is this is what we see. So uh, purple are susceptibles. The gray are infectives, and the yellow are the recovered. And we see a rise in susceptible, but it's kind of exponential. It rises up, it reaches the peak, and then it comes down. Let's talk about this, ladies and gentlemen. Let's talk about this. I want you to have a rock solid intuition. So let's let's reason about what's going on. So first, for susceptibles, it's going down. And you said it's going down because no one can come in. And that's true. And in general, if we state it more generically, if we compare outflow and inflow to susceptibles, which of them is bigger, inflow or outflow? Uh, at first, inflow is bigger, but then outflow is bigger. Well, here, what's the inflow to susceptibles? There's no there's no inflow and and by implications we we could say it's zero right I mean, there's yeah. nobody coming in right yeah. I mean we could represent it as an and we could stick an inflow there and give it a rate of zero and it's the same thing right so so is outflow greater than inflow or vice versa okay inflow is zero outflow is outflow is zero. Uh, at the at the start, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so in general, as we run this and as it's coming down, is uh, which is bigger than which? Uh, outflow is bigger than inflow, right? I mean, it almost doesn't need emphasis, and so it's coming down, right? If we're recovered, is inflow greater than outflow, or vice versa? There's no there's no outflow, so inflow is greater than outflow, so it goes up. Now let's talk about I. Speak to me, use as in one voice in a Greek chorus, veritably, uh, about how I is changing. So initially, I is growing or shrinking. Growing. That's the that's the the thread, right? What does that indicate about inflow and outflow for I? Inflow is greater than outflow. For the infectives, the inflow is greater than the outflow. So it grows, right? If water is coming in your bathtub faster than it's going out, it's going to be rising, right? Um, so it rises at first. And we'll come back to why it rises so quickly. But it, it rises up very quickly at first. And then it reaches this peak where it plateaus. It, Reaches a a kind of point where it no longer grows. Well, at that very peak, at the very summit, at the the very tip of that, what is equal to? Well, what is the case? And outflow is equal to inflow. Exactly right. Outflow is equal to inflow. I think. That's why you see they're going up and over going down, right? That's their balance, right? When outflow equals inflow, we get a situation where this equals zero, right? Is the whole system in, in equilibrium here? No, no, most certainly not. Most certainly not. Well, for example, one thing is changing when when in fact, it is, it is, no, it is no longer changing as a peak. What thing is still changing? Um, well, well, let me plot it down. I mean, 
Well, susceptibles is still going down, right? Why is susceptible still going down? Because people are still getting affected. But if people are getting affected, why isn't I rising? Because what? Because they're recovering just as fast as they are getting infected, right? That's why I is not rising. Susceptible is still dropping and recovers are rising, right? Yes, not you. In, in that case, meaning uh, in the at the peak, they won't necessarily uh, be the same value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it doesn't always follow that there is the same. It, 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 they you notice these things, but yeah, no, it's not. Um, it's not. It will depend on the parameterization involved. Definitely, it's not an invariant about these sort of parts. Okay, so at this peak. For susceptibles, inflow equals outflow, and the IDT equals equals zero. It's it's not going up, it's not going down, so it's equal to zero. But the RDT is still positive, it's still rising because people are still recovering, right? And the SDT is still negative because people are still getting infected, infected, but it's a for effective uh, rate of number of people recovering. Uh, the rate at which people are recovering per day. So maybe there's 20 people per day recovering and 20 people per day getting infected. So the number of infectives is no longer going up or down, it's staying the same. Does that make sense? That's at the population level. The number of infectives, for, for the number of infectives, it's not rising. The number of, and why is it rising at the population level? The, the rate in terms of people per day getting affected is the same as the rate of recovery. So it's no longer going up or down, right? 10 people getting infected per day, 10 people recovering per day. So at an individual level, we can also describe it. How would we describe it there? At an individual level, how many people does an individual infect at that peak? Someone is infected. How many people are they infected before they recover? One. One. They just replace themselves. They're just replacing themselves. If, if I is infected, we're in a situation where I can infect two people. And each of those people can infect two people. So the number of infectives would be right, right? Um, but if I'm in a situation where I, on average, I won't even get a replacement for myself by the time I recover, it'll be dropping, right? If when I exactly nominate someone, I say, hey, Ardon, you know, uh, I'm about to recover, I'm going to get you infected when you take over, right? That's when it's no longer going down or up, right? Now, there's a term for what I just described. How many people someone infects before they recover from the general situation, like in the middle of an outbreak disorder? What is that term called? It's not forced infection. You're getting close. It's what? There's actually a term you would have heard it probably dozens, if not hundreds of times during the pandemic. It's called the. You know, Oh. Okay, it has <laughs> it, 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 it has three words in it. And it, 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 the second one begins with an R, first one begins with an E, and the last one begins with an N. It's uh <laughs> and okay, so how many words that how, how many <laughs> okay. so so there's this general class of terms, which are in that video, that were called the reproductive what? Number. Yeah, not reproductive health. Reproductive number. Okay? Um, reproductive number. 
What we were just referring to is the effective reproduction. That's at any time during this outbreak, you consider it effective. How many people did they infect before they were hmm? hmm. That's the effective reproduction number here. Okay. Um, so this is at any time. Okay. Um, there's a very special one if we consider an infective in the middle of a population that's otherwise totally susceptible. Where in the model would we see that? Where or when in the model would we see one person infected in an otherwise susceptible population? At the start, at the very start. And let's go see why that is. Here we have number of infectives for each stock at system dynamics. We specify an initial value. And the initial value of infectives is what? One. And everyone else is susceptible. There ain't nobody recovered. So the basic reproductive number is what applies there. The question is, for that single person in an otherwise susceptible population, how many people do they infect before they recover? If everyone around me is susceptible, I'm the first infected in Saskatoon with monkeypox or with COVID or with measles, uh, you know, back in, in 1850 or whatever. How many people would I infect before I recover? Yes, there it is. Yes. Yeah. So let's. So it's got to depend on the stuff, right? Because they're not having any contact. They're staying at home, staying in their basement, you know, they're not going to be getting affected with any, uh, not going to affect anyone. What other things? So contacts are going to be one of the things that this depends on. Let's see, the, the rate of contact. What's something else it would depend on? Yeah. Uh, probability of transmission given a contact, right? So if everyone's wearing staff, it will lower beta. Don't mind that noise of the, the really, really stupid analysis. I'm sorry. Uh, um, there's limits to what associational studies could do. There's times that it's not the right tool. Associational studies are great, but there, there's a recent meta-analysis. <laughs> It's just like out to lunch. Anyway, beta is the probability of of transmission per discordant contact, meaning per contact we don't have susceptible and effective beta. So truly it depends on this, right? If if somehow you could ensure things so that um uh the person is infective has contact, but they're in a you know, they're in one of those those hazmat suits, they're not gonna affect anyone, right? Beta will be zero. They have lots of contacts, but they won't affect it. So surely it depends on C and beta. What else would it depend on? If I want to consider the total number of people that they could affect before they recover, what else would it depend on? Not TSS's handout. How long they're infected. Let's reason about this. Let's reason about this, ladies and gentlemen. We stand. You sit on the cusp of greatness okay okay um so ladies and gentlemen let's let's read about this in this model so suppose we have at the start of the model one infective in an otherwise susceptible population how many people let's figure out the basic reproduction number for this model so if we start in the model with one person initially infected and everyone else is susceptible. How many people do they have contact with total per day? We already gave that, right? What is that? Well, well, okay, but it, 
what's the name of the what's the name of the constant, the symbol that we use to denote how many people per day they have contact? With? C, right? They have contact with C total people per day who are uh, with total people per day. Maybe it's a hundred, right? Now, at the start, if they're the first effective and everyone else is susceptible, how many of those C people per day they're having contact with, how many of them are susceptible? All of them. So they have contact with how many? So if this, this susceptible is having contact with C people per day. Um, what, what, I'm sorry, if this infective is having contact with C people per day, all of them are, are, are susceptible, then, then they have contact with C susceptibles per day. For each of those susceptibles that they have contact with per day, um, they have probability beta of infecting them, right? So on average, how many of those will be infected? Beta C, C times beta, yeah, right? They have contacts with C total people per day. Um, and because everyone else is susceptible, besides themselves, they, they have contact with C susceptible per day. And each of those is a probability beta of being infected. So on average, expected number of people they'll infect of those is uh, per unit pump per day is C beta. And then the final thing we have to take into account, as Matthias has said, is how many days they're infected. C beta is the number of people they will infect per one. Per, per what? Per day. Because they see contacts with other people per day. And suppose, you know, that are, and, and all, suppose all of those are susceptible. So 100 susceptibles per day, and suppose each of those, they have 0.01 chance of infecting, then, then they'll, con they'll have, on average, 100 times 0.01, or one person per day they'll infect. And then, that's per day. They may be infected for 10 days, right? So we got to take that into account to take into account how many people they will infect before they recover, which is what this reproductive number says for both these reproductive numbers, basic and, and effective. So the basic reproductive number for this model is C times beta times tau. Yes, Matthew. Uh, after day one, yes. Yeah, we consider that they are in a sea of susceptible, right? And the idea is that, look, they're the first infected. There are 300 stinking infect of susceptibles around them, right? Um, initially. So it is true that they're going to infect maybe one a day, but for all intents and purposes, we're assuming they're broadly mixing. And now, this is, a, this is an assumption of these models, random mixing. They're going, it's like they're going out to the bus station and they're going to Sobeys to buy groceries and they're, you know, they're they're going and mixing with people in class and it's just so many people that are susceptible. Just because they affected one, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't, it's not going to change much about this. So this is the basic reproductive number. It's a reproductive number. It says, how many people will an infective infect before they recover? But it's in a very specific circumstance. The fact that it's basic is because it's when everyone else, besides this original infective, else is susceptible. Okay, that's what it refers to. This this very specific circumstance. And effective is referring to it at any time during it. So when we run this model, we have initially, what's the reproductive number here? Well, it's C times beta times tau. So it's, so C, sorry, C is here, 20. Beta is 0.1. 
So C times beta is two, right? 20 times 0. 0.1 times the mean time infective, 10. So what's the basic reproductive number? 20 times 0. 0.1 times 10, right? What? That's a scary big one. That's like measles or like Omicron, current Omicron. So it's like, uh, you know, BQ1.1 and now more recently XBB 1.5. And so it's, these are like the current, the current crop of, of uh, sub, sub variants with COVID-19 have reproductive numbers around that. You know what, uh, you know what uh, COVID started at? And, and what, what was the basic reproductive number of covered COVID started? We estimated for the problem. You know what it was roughly? 3.5. 3.5. Guess what, it mutated. Double, double, double like a cubulus. Whole story. Blow by blow, where that happened. Alpha was bad, and then you, then you got gamma, which uh, increased it further. And then delta yet further, and then omicron was the was the coup de grace. Okay, so so the basic reproductive number, ladies and gentlemen, for this model is twenty. And when you see that, initially, what's going on? is one person who's infected will infect on average how many people before they recover in this model initially fine and each of those people will infect about 20 big population right so by the second generation you get 400 right 20 and 20 right and then you get the third generation another fun right right eight thousand right I think it's not going to grow by Sorry? Because um, when someone gets infected, assuming they're not going to get infected again, so it's not going to start changing on its own. Okay, so what you're referring to is that for the first few generations, the basic reproductive number is about right. I mean, it, because there's tons of susceptibles around. And so, you know, 400 people being infected is not materially lowering the number of people they're likely to affect. If you assume randomness, that they're all mixing together. But as we start to get larger and larger, these questions start to get questionable because people live with other people and most of their contacts may be with others that they see day to day. And, and a lot of those will start to get infected. So the approximations, I'll be with you in a minute, but the basic reproductive number is often used to get a sense of early on, how fast will it be growing? And guess what? It will grow if I infect two people before I recover, they recover, before I recover rather. And each of them infect two before they recover, and each of them infect two, it's gonna be growing successively as in this doubling sort of way or doubling over a period of time given by the, the time of time. Mm -hmm. um, so it grows and it grows over the entire time period, something like e to the r zero over tau, the, the, the intergenerational time, the time between these generations. So this is called the basic reproductive number is called R0 or R0, because that's called not in Britain, which is where the term was coined, or it's called R star or R E is the effective reproductive number. So initially you start with the basic reproductive number being a, a pretty good estimate and it doubles and it rises exponentially. And that's exactly what we see in this. It rises exponentially. One person infects two, infects four, infects eight, et cetera. And you get this sort of this sort of rise. But after a while, as was mentioned, this approximation 
start breaking down. It's only headed on the head. So early on, it rises exponentially. See it going faster, faster, faster. But what's the limiting factor? Number of susceptible. It's like fire spreads, but but it needs wood. Keep on going. It needs wood. It needs added wood. If it starts running low on wood, it will impede the efficiency with which it can spread, right? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, you have this initial doubling, 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 and this exponential growth from this type of, of, uh, of formula. And it rises, rises, but it, as it rises, it's undercutting its variability to rise. It's self-limited because there are fewer and fewer susceptible. So it reaches a peak where two things are true. And I need you to know this. Please. Number one, at that peak, the inflow to attractive equals the what? Outflow. That's why it's not going up or down, right? It's staying the same. At an, that's at the population level. At an individual level, how many people at that peak is an effective infecting before they recover? So if I'm an infective and over the entire course of my illness, I infect one person. I just, it's like I find my replacement. At that, that's why it's not far right? Because there's no more effectives after I recover than there were when I started, but right, and then it starts coming down. We can think of this in terms of feedbacks early on. What feedback is operating here? Where's the feedback, ladies and gentlemen, that's dominant, that's the driving one early on here? Can you point out the feedback that drives it early on? Sorry? It's a positive feedback. It's a reinforcing feedback. And what does it involve? Well, okay. New infections lead to more infectives, which leads to higher fractional prevalence, which leads to higher force of infection. In other words, higher chance that a susceptible will be infected per unit time. Because those more infected around, they're more likely to get infected, and, and, and that breeds more infectious. Initially, this is the feedback. It's a positive feedback. More breeds more. More new infections means more people infect, you know, getting infected, more people who can spread infection, higher fraction prevalence, higher force of infection facing the remaining susceptibles, and this operates. Good. But what's also happening here, Utwal, as, as Utwal is referring to, is that it also depletes the number of susceptible. Maybe we could get a, some pictures of me in there too. Mm -hmm. uh, so it depletes the number of susceptible. So as you go for the basic reproduction that we're doubling, it starts undercutting itself. So there's, as we're growing this, it's also depleting the susceptibles, right? Because people come down here and that draws them out of susceptible. They, they um, new infections occur, it draws it out of susceptible. So there's a, there's a balancing loop here that depletes susceptibles. The more people get infected, the fewer susceptibles to infect them. The more susceptible, so if I were to draw it as a feedback here, the more susceptible, the more new infections, right? If I have an increase in susceptibles, um, is this a plus or minus connection between susceptible to new infections? The count of susceptibles is number of new infections. This, is this a plus or minus connection? Plus. And then there's a link back for new infectives to susceptibles. Is this a minus or a plus? A minus. If new infections go up, susceptible goes down compared to the value it otherwise would have had, although the thing be equal. So overall, this is what sort of loop? Minus, or is it a balancing? In other words, a negative feedback or a reinforcing? Uh, it's a negative feedback. You multiply the sign. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of sign. 
Okay. So that's the balancing feedback that starts to limit it here. And then what's going on now? What's the major feedback driving what we see now coming down? What do you think is limiting this slope? It is, I'll give you a hint, it begins with R. Recovery. And there's a feedback here. The more infected, the more new recoveries, the more new recoveries, the fewer infected. So it draws it down. Do you see that? And it's going down and down. Okay. Um, so if you think about this from a from a standpoint of feedback structure, the initial time this this uh, reinforcing feedback operates, then it kind of the dominant shift to the one for the patient of susceptible. And then it shifts to this recovery from the study. And it turns out there's mathematical tools you can build. We're, we're building categorical versions of tools that report at what time different feedbacks are driving the system. What's the dominant one right now? And the point here is in nonlinear models, the feedbacks shift and they're dominant. Something that's a dominant feedback early on here, the Infection feedback is no longer dominant later. Do you see that? Okay, now. So I think we understand a lot of these features. Introduce reproductive, basic, ineffective reproductive number. But now I want to get around. You may be wondering when I'm going to get around to it, to the exercise. So in the exercise, ladies and gentlemen, I asked you, to go add a waning of immunity representation. So what did that affect? Where did the flow, what, what flow was added here? Anyone? So I had this take home exercise and I said, modify it to represent the process of losing immunity where, where people, um, uh, oh, okay. Um, right. Um, yes, exactly. So, so how does it how does it affect it? And the mean time is one year for them to lose immunity. So, how would I represent the loss of immunity here? Anyone? Okay, good. So I need to add a flow. Let's go do that. There we go. So actually, I'm going to call this model by all. Yes, it's an OSIRS. Good. Okay to make sure so i'm gonna i'm gonna put this up here and i am going to put this over here and put this up here and i'm going to bend it to my will by the rectilinear conventions of system dynamics there we go and this will be um uh, uh waning of immunity. What did I say to call it? Did I say call it waning of immunity? I should really do the lower case. I'd like to reserve all their cases for for uh, stocks. Okay. Um. So good. Um. So there needs to be what what does waning of immunity depend on? Anyone? Okay. I recovered and what else? duration of immunity exactly so we need some variable that's like mean time to lose immunity something like that um uh so we could call it mean duration of immunity kind of nice rather than talk about um mean time we could just say duration which implies time there we go and what else does it depend on? What else must it depend on? Yeah, recovered. Because there's nobody who's going to lose immunity unless they're recovered people to lose it, right? Okay, uh, good. And what's the formula for this going to be? Recovered, and is it divided or time, I mean duration? Divided. It has to be. It's a flow. It's people per unit time. 
This is a time when we divide the stock of people by that time to get people per unit time. Okay, uh, so, so that's good. Um, and why is it saying it's an unhappy camper? It's used but not infected. Did I not, did I, this one? This one, okay, ah, there we are. Thank you, thank you, yeah. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, here we go. And the mean duration of immunity, I said to use 365. Hmm? Okay, now, how does this change? Uh, so, uh, yes, Ardalan. So the reason it's working is that though, since now uh, people are spending some uh, cells, then they are immune after one year, they become uh, susceptible to that. Yes. After a short time, it will go up and then it will go down and then we will have that well as the time. Okay. So that's like immune therapy. Herd immunity? Herd immunity? Yes. Okay. Okay. So. So let's talk about what's going on here in the first hundred days, and then let's let's um, let's uh, branch uh, to, to to look at a longer time. Okay, so so by adding this, what is different? Can anyone point out something? At at first glance, in the first hundred days, first glance things seem uh, roughly similar, but there's some subtle differences going on. Yes, Ardalan. The number of tumor recovery never got to zero. They actually still do it that far. Okay, okay. So, sorry, the number of recovery. Oh, you mean the number of susceptible? Susceptible. Susceptible. And in fact, susceptible is now, in this period of time, is going, it's doing what? It's going up. It's rising. And if susceptible is rising, what does that tell us about inflows and outflows? There's no, there's no inflow since it's up all. There is. Yeah. Okay. There is an inflow. And what do we know? If it's rising, what do we know about the relationship of inflows and outflows? Inflow is bigger than the outflow, right? Um, so what does that mean in, in, in concrete terms of these flows? It means there's more people. Well, yes, but losing their immunity per day, then there are new infections, right, during this period. So successful is going up, uh, here, right? Uh, that's a purple line. Notice number of infected before went down to zero, just about, right? It, it, went, it went down and kept on dropping because why would it keep on dropping? Why would it be going down? Why did the number of infected previously, before we added this, why did it go? down towards zero. Because each successful infected fewer than one person before recovering, or the outflow, there's more people recovering than there were infected, new people getting infected per day. So it just kept it going down. So it went down towards zero. To, to you know, just pursue uh, and item down to zero. It, it, it did not stabilize its no value. But here, it actually stabilizes and starts to go up. Do you notice something else about recovered here? The, the, the yellow curve? It's going down. Why would it be going down? That would mean what is greater than what? If this is going down, the outflow must be greater than the inflow, which means that the rate of people are losing immunity per day, the number of people losing immunity per day. Must be greater than the people recovering from that, right? Uh, okay. So, um, yes, sir. One. So, when you have to think that every one year, like yeah, that's like when you take how they come to so every one year, um, uh, one people are going to be safe. Okay, one people every one year are going to add to that. No, so no, it's on average. You are never going to see the number of people that you drive at one but very fast. No, no, because it's memoryless. It's it's over time. There's a gradual chance of people. Some people, some people actually lose their immunity well before this. Some people lose it after it. It's not a sudden thing in this model. It's memoryless. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
no, I didn't say that. I said on average, the mean time here. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna simulate this for 730 days now. And to do that, I have to go futz with this darn chart and make sure that it will it will display up to 730. We're running out of time here and a time window of 730. This is one of any logics painful sides. Okay, so um, let's run this. And what will we see over this longer two year time frame? Okay, multiple waves. So, so we're gonna see the number of susceptibles go up and then we'll see, yes, there's a second, there's a second wave of sorts. So here's the first wave here. With infectives, and here's the second wave here. The fact that number of infectives are going up around time 100, what is that telling us? In terms of inflows and outflows, what is it telling us the number of uh, infectives is going up here? It's telling us that what? The rate of inflow, the number of new infections per day is greater than the number of new recoveries per day. So the number of infectives rises, right? Uh, and what does it tell us at an individual level? If the number of infections is rising, what does it say about each infection? That they're infecting what? More than one person before they recover. You notice it goes up, but then it, then it stabilizes again. It goes down a bit. Why is that? Because once again, the septal grows, but it got drained down. And now they're going. And they're reaching some sort of equilibrium. And at that equilibrium, what is the case? We actually had it up here on the board in the early part of the lecture. And then I said, we'll be back to it. What is the case at this equilibrium right now? By the way, there's an additional term here. Now we have a term, I wish we had another color, but time is short. Um, so uh, this is going to be minus what? What what did we add? R over R over we'll call it um, well we'll call it I attempted to say omega, but omega is generally a rate per unit time, so I'll call it R, R over U. Um, this is a minus, and we have an R over U up here flowing in. This is the loss of immunity from R and the, the arrival of those folks at S. And what is the case at this equilibrium here, this here equilibrium, what is the case for each of these? If, if, if all of them are constant like this, they're not going up, they're not going down, what is the SDT? Zero. What is the, the IDT? Zero. It's not going up or down either. Look at the gray line, the flattest in sky. Um, and what is R? Zero, all right? Um, so each of these is zero. But finally, what else is to at an individual level? At this point in time, where these things are flat and infectives is not rising, how many people, are there infectives at that final time? There are. How many people do they infect before they recover? One, one stinking person. One unlucky is affected by, and that keeps it in balance. That is the thing that keeps it in balance. Does that make sense? So at that point, you'll notice that all these flows are equal. The flow of new infection, 760. The flow of new recovery, 760. The flow of waiting on the end, 760,000. It's all here and found because they're arranged in a linear way. They're branching with, you know, going to different places. It wouldn't just always be linearly equal or directly uh, always in sequence like that, exactly the same value. But ladies and gentlemen, the mathematics and intuitions behind communicable disease models, both one time FIR models and models with the circulating with the circulating population. And that is all we have time for today. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Thank you very much. Beautiful.
Uh, I will post this all. Thank you. I'll post uh, the updated model. Thank you, Arnold. And I will make myself serious.